I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first thing on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Does anyone have any changes, additions, questions on the existing agenda? Go ahead, Mike. Mayor, one just technical correction under agenda item number two. Uh, the uh, maintenance agreement with MnDOT actually goes through June 30th of 2021. Okay, we'll make that correction. Anything else? If not, I guess I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the change of the year on uh, item number two. Second. Okay. We got a second by Amy Jerk. There's no other questions or comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, the agenda is approved 5 0. First thing, uh, we are going to have uh, a presentation by Chris Cabot, city engineer, uh, to kind of go over the 2020 Main Street project, and then we will open it up for a public hearing. Okay, thank you, Mayor, members of the city council and public. Uh, we are here for the, uh, the public hearing for the Truck Company 19 Main Street 2020 Improvement Project. Uh, I think I mentioned it, there is uh, an agenda back there. There's also a sign-in if you uh, are here for the public hearing, if you could sign in at least before you leave so we know who was, was here for that. A uh, little bit of procedurals as well. As Again, as the mayor mentioned, I'll have a presentation. I'll open it to uh, have the, the council an opportunity to ask questions. And then at that point, the mayor will open it up to the public for comment. So um, again, we're here for the public hearing for the, uh, the 2020 Downtown Main Street project. The uh, scope of the project, uh, the reconstruction portion, this portion shown in red, is from Trunk Highway 21 on the west side to 7th Street Southeast on the east side, which is right near the uh, strip mall. I do need to mention there is a small little portion of uh, mill and overlay that's uh, planned on the hill going up to the west from 21, but this is basically just a maintenance um, application that just needs to be done in a, in, with this project, probably at the beginning before anything gets, really gets going. A little bit of history on the project. Um, big catalyst for this project and needing to do it is because the sewer and water is basically 100 years old. It'll be 100 years old by the time we do this project. Uh, the clay sewers are were built in 1921. The water probably predates that, certainly. Concrete pavement was installed back in the 1930s uh, through most of the downtown, and a lot of that concrete pavement is still there today underneath the blacktop, at least where it hasn't been removed by utility repair. Obviously, a lot happened over that era. Uh, up until 1990 was when the um, basically the boulevard project took place, where the curb uh, or the brick boulevards were done, and bump outs, uh, some of the sidewalk work, lighting, etc., took place. So that's uh, getting 30 years old and uh, getting uh, seeing the end of its life. So now we're looking at uh, the need for improvements. Um, obviously, the MnDOT um, was looking at doing improvements on this section. Um, they wanted to initially do a mill and overlay in about 2018. Um, and we said, time out, we have to deal with the utility. So back in 2013, the three had here. Again, MnDOT first contacted the city about doing a future overlay in 18. Um, we responded immediately with concerns about the utilities. Um, in July of that year, we met with MnDOT uh, to discuss what is the future and how can, how can we look at this in, in a different scope or frame of mind. Um, by April 15th, we met again to discuss options for doing some more major improvement. And uh, in June of that year, the City Council approved a resolution in support of the project and in support of the city leading the project because if MnDOT, we waited for MnDOT to do it, we were looking at the possibility <coughs> by 2025 or 2026 before anything uh, would even take place, if at all. Uh, October 2016, 
Uh, the city council approved the joint powers agreement between MnDOT and the city to uh, move the project forward and with the city as the lead agency in cooperation with MnDOT. And in uh, that same me meeting in October, the city council ordered the, the, uh, the preparation of the feasibility study, which is basically what is been presented or is being presented here tonight. The feasibility study again outlines the scope of work, the approximate cost, and how we would propose to pay for this, how, how it's going to be funded. Um, so we worked on preliminary design from 16 till the present, and we're here in a public hearing. So this is basically ending the first phase of, uh, of the project, which is the feasibility phase. Uh, the process we've been on um, to develop this project, um, first and foremost, it was the project management team uh, put together of city staff, uh, SEH engineers, uh, as well as MnDOT. And I should, uh, I failed to introduce my project manager for the project, Nikki Farrington, who is the project manager on this project. I am serving as the city engineer, as the city engineer, and this is, uh, this process we're going through now is all part of the 429 public improvement process. So this falls under the city realm. Um, there's been a stakeholder committee uh, formed to help provide direction to the project management team. And, uh, and again, we're bringing all this together to council. There's been a number of uh, uh, public uh, outreach meetings, open houses, uh, as well as a neighborhood meeting that was held at the end of, end of April to basically present the draft study. Um, I'm not going to get into this in detail, but just again, just to emphasize as part of that uh, stakeholder committee, the project management team has really identified the vision of this project, what, the, what, what people are looking for in this project, and uh, this was just a little exercise that was gone through to kind of divide, you know, what, is, what are some of the important things that, again, that make New Prague special seen the words here that I think the big ones that stick out stand out the other other was what, what kind of things are important on the project against parking was a big issue for a lot of the business owners traffic etc so what is the scope of this project as we see it this is as we see it today and I can't find a, a simpler way to to say it other than it's everything uh, it's not only the streets that we see on the surface, the sidewalks, but it's all the utilities that are underground, the sanitary sewer, the water, the storm sewer, street lighting, landscaping, um, you name it. Um, again, on that whole mile, one mile corridor, we're looking at major improvements. This happens to be a photo from uh, St. James, a very similar highway project in their downtown. So is it? Part of the dark discussions uh, over the last year, about a year, year and a half with MnDOT, uh, there was a lot of discussions over street width. Um, this is to point out what's out there as it exists today. There was some striping, the white line, white line striping that was placed at the edge of the driving lane last year to illustrate an 11 foot lane. Um, you can see there was actually tick marks out there before. They were more like, it was more the flip-flop before. It was more like 14-foot driving lanes and 11-foot parking. But when that was striped, it defined 11-foot lane, and what was the balance was 14 feet. I show that because I want to compare it to what, was, what is proposed. So um, again, what's out there existing today is 50-foot curb-to-curb. MnDOT traffic engineers actually had suggested that they would like a 40 foot wide street. Um, the narrow streets will encourage slower traffic, but it probably lowers the comfort level for those that are um, parking and getting out of their cars and things like that. Uh, the reason it slows traffic is it makes it a little more uncomfortable for the traffic that's moving through town as well. Again, statistically, that's true. There was a lot of concerns because this is a downtown and there's issues with snow storage and where to put the snow and how to clear the snow. Uh, the city had preferred a 46 foot width as a compromise to obviously what's out there today, which frankly is too wide. Um, there was a lot of back and forth debate and ultimately where we landed was a compromise at 44 feet. Um, again, 
and 46 was the city's initial preferred, 40 was Mindai's desire, and 44 was our compromise. So what that gives us, um, again, I noted that out there right now is 11-foot driving lanes are striped. Uh, on paper, what's being presented to Mindai is actually a 12-foot lane, which is actually pretty fairly standard in the 10-foot parking. This is uh, more than adequate for uh, uh, normal use. What that will do is it will provide an extra three foot of, uh, of width on the sidewalk. So it will be an additional three feet for the pedestrians, et cetera. Well, that's odd. My center one didn't turn off. Huh. So um, just to illustrate what 10 foot looks like versus 12 foot. I had an 11 foot here. I don't know what happened to the It's odd. So, um, Glenn and I did a little exercise this past summer to just kind of illustrate, this is like if you park really poorly, like two feet off the curb, and you open the door, and what does that mean to the, to the passing vehicles and the person getting out, et cetera. And this, you know, this illustrates how it might look. Again, the truck can have more room than the smaller vehicle. But this 10-foot parking in relation to the white line is what, what we're looking to generally look like out there. The residential area is a little different. So the width, the existing width of the residential area down by the funeral home is actually existing is 44 feet. We're not proposing any changes in that area. It'll actually be the same width in the downtown as it is out on the easterly end of town. But what we do like to illustrate is that we've driven through the area during a funeral. There's a lot of cars there. People drive slower. It feels a little congested. Um, that might be the feel that you're feeling in the downtown. Again, 12-foot parking lane, or 12-foot driving lane, 10-foot parking lane, and then in that residential area, there'll be the Green Boulevard and sidewalk. And actually, that sidewalk will be proposed at six feet. Obviously, part of what we're looking at is not building the project or the road for the traffic. In 2020 and 2021, we're looking at far out, 2035, 2040. I say 20, we're short 2035 because we have the data we have is from 2015 and projected 20 feet out or 20 years out. Um, so we're obviously projecting growth. This is statistically based on growth. I don't know if it'll happen that, that much, but again, showing the traffic through downtown growing from just under 8,400 vehicles a day to over 12,000 vehicles a day. Um, today, Truck traffic's about 400 and some, and projecting as much as 600 and some again in the future. These are conservative, but obviously we have to anticipate and plan for the future, not for the year 2021 when the project opens up. So traffic control, discussions on traffic control is uh, obviously important. At First Avenue Southeast, we have the, uh, the signal that exists there today. Um, and then in Columbus, we have we have no traffic control. Other than, well, we have a two-way stop. Um, people tend not to use Columbus because it's hard to get out on the Columbus. And again, looking at the needs of the future, um, in 2021, the, the, the data doesn't necessarily justify a traffic control <coughs> signal or roundabout <coughs> at Columbus, but further out in 2035, 2040, it's definitely going to be more certainly by then. So we needed to look at what we're doing in the future. So we did look at both of these options. This <coughs> image here is from St. James. They did two mini roundabouts. There's actually another one off in the distance where their trunk highway does like a, a zigzag through town using the mini roundabouts where they actually fit within the existing right of way. So there was what they called an intersection control evaluation was done to determine number one, could we justify them? Um, and what type of control was warranted. The report, in the end, recommended the many roundabouts because um, signals are actually more costly. Um, there's the maintenance is in, involved and they're not necessarily safer. In fact, the many roundabouts are statistically safer than the signal system. So I would encourage people, if you have any interest on that, um, we're not going to play this, but there's actually video. If you go to our project website, or you can even do the, the uh, YouTube channel here, but yeah, if you actually go to our website, there is a link to 
a video, this YouTube video of the St. James roundabout and showing the traffic passing, passing through the roundabouts. Um, this, I guess this image was just really to illustrate, um, as part of this project, we have a main focus on accessibility, pedestrians, and meeting the uh, American Disabilities Act requirements, so the ADA as we refer to it. Um, obviously, by narrowing the rope, we're gaining three feet of width, so actually the six feet will be more like uh, eight to nine feet for that pedestrian zone, and we'll gain more in what we're calling the utility zone. That's that space between the curb and the sidewalk where the lights will go, some of the small utilities, electric conduit, you name it. There's a little bit more width on, the, on that sidewalk because you know, most of the areas in the downtown, uh, the buildings are two to three feet off the right of way. So while this is sidewalk, and it'll also be improved under the project, it's technically outside the right of way and uh, uh, technically <coughs> on private property. Uh, and I'll mention it further on in my, in my agenda, but one thing that we will have to be doing, we will be doing is contacting every property owner along the project to um, obtain a, they call it a temporary easement or right of entry, uh, construction easement. It's basically to help restore those two feet that we need to uh, adjust a grade into a vestibule or in some cases uh, to reconnect utilities into the building. So it's really in the per property owner's best interest. So we'll be doing that. Also, um, again, a lot of questions that are asked about the bump outs. Again, this is this shows the image of uh, the roundabout area at uh, First Avenue Southeast. Uh, bump outs that exist there today will be perpetuated. Uh, they will, will continue to have those. The main reason for those is it helps for pedestrian safety. It shortens the distance that that pedestrian needs to walk across the street. It also allows better visibility of the pedestrian from, from the driver. The driver is able to see them because they're out past the parked cars, yet they're still on the safety area of, uh, of a curved sidewalk. Um, this uh, images to help uh, illustrate some of the concepts that were discussed in the stakeholder committee and likely be some of the, the uh, uh, type of landscape and the streetscape that we'll be looking at. Mostly normal concrete, but maybe some, some colored bands to help uh, break things up. The, the mini roundabouts, colored islands, and et cetera, to help illustrate that, uh, that roundabout. And I'll get into a little bit more detail on that. So the streetscaping and landscaping is still in the early stages. It's, it's more been discussed on concept with the stakeholder committee. Uh, we'll be working more with them and actually looking to bring in some other individuals to help offer input and help uh, provide direction on, on landscaping concepts. But a lot of things that were discussed that are, that are looking to be scope of this whole project are things that are listed here, like uh, planters, benches, flags, banners, bike racks potentially, lighting, uh, concrete accents, et cetera. Again, none of this is set in stone yet. Some of these things may come or go, um, but these are a lot of the concepts were uh, brought up as, as, as uh, priorities for, for the streetscape and the landscaping on the project. Again, just more just to illustrate concepts. So I guess I just left this in here as, um, again, it's likely to change, but kind of the idea is that uh, the direction and the concepts that we're going. One thing I do want to point out um, is the lighting is proposed to be changed from what's out there today. Um, I, think I mentioned at the last council meeting, the, the glow fixtures that were placed in uh, um, back in 1990 um, are old and inefficient. And they, they would need to be replaced regardless. And so the, really the, the biggest question was whether we perpetuate that design. Um, that did appear on some historic images, um, or do we look at something a little different? Um, I mentioned uh, that this was looked at in, uh, as part of the preliminary design is whether or not this is a, a historic uh, 
Obviously, there's historic buildings. It is an historic downtown, but did it meet the requirements of a historic district? And as they determined that a, a state historical um, office determined as there wasn't a uh, heavy enough concentration of historic buildings all in one location to declare it a historic district, even though there's still historic buildings and it adds to the downtown. What that did is it allowed us a little more flexibility on things like the lighting. Um, if it was a historic district, we might have had, had some resistance if we looked at some different type of lighting. So with that said, um, there was a lot of discussion on looking at lighting that's not only more efficient from a lighting standpoint, but more efficient from um, you know, electrical use, uh, light pollution, you name it. Um, and looking at, at some type of different type of fixture. Again, something that looks historic, fits in the downtown, but is a little different than the lighting that's there today. So this at this point, the fi actual fixtures haven't been selected, but I think we're looking at some type of concept like this where there'll be some higher li upper lighting to light the roadway and intersections and lower lighting to light pedestrian ways. Um, it won't require as many fixtures either as, as all the globes that are in the downtown, just because again, it'll be more efficient than what's there today. The type of poles that would be used would also give the flexibility for uh, public works to the utilities to paying banners and potentially uh, planters, et cetera. So it gives a lot more flexibility than what we've done with those light poles. So from the city standpoint, this project is really, again, utility driven. And as I noted, there will be full replacement of all the utility, utilities, storm sewer, and then the city owns the sanitary sewer and the water mains, and all those need to be replaced. Again, they're close to 100 years old. Um, in addition to the mains and the road being replaced, the service laterals that extend from the mains and the road to the buildings will also be replaced. Uh, sanitary sewer is relatively not a big issue to deal with. Um, the service laterals will be replaced up to as, about as close to the foundation as uh, can be accomplished, and it'll be reattached to the pipe that's coming out of the building. Property owners may want to look at seeing if there's anything they want to do or need to do to accommodate that in the future. They can do things like lining, et cetera, after the fact. Pretty simple to deal with. The bigger challenge is the water line, water. And when I say that, so the water main in the, in the road will be replaced. Service laterals going up to the properties um, need to be replaced and brought all the way back into the buildings um, and connected to the plumbing inside the buildings. So we're going to have to work with every property owner um, to determine a process of how to make this work. Um, most likely, we'll be looking at um, bidding the main general contractor work being the, the service line um, from the main up to a shutoff valve, which is in the, is in the edge of the sidewalk, and then, then also having a contract to bring the water services into the buildings. Again, this will be a big deal for um, just logistics and uh, making things work. The other challenge in dealing with water, water during construction is we need to maintain water services to the buildings. And while that water main's gone, there won't be any water in it. So typically, and I'll have a little illustration or a photo to illustrate this a little later, but likely what they'll do is they'll put a temporary water service out in the, uh, probably the edge of the sidewalk as construction starts. A lot of that sidewalk will stay in, the existing sidewalk will stay in place during the bulk of construction and that water line will likely get tapped into a temporary service into the service coming out of the building to provide temporary water, as we call it, while the contractor builds the water main and extends the services out when the curb stops. And then at some point, again, somebody will have to come in and bring that service the rest of the way into the building. Just giving you a little segue, when I talk about uh, water service assessments, we're talking about two, two Potentially of two, two assessments for water service. One being the water service that's out in the roadway, and then a, another cost to bring it into the buildings. 
for the properties, like the residential properties or any buildings that are set way back from the right of way, it's really a non issue. The water service will be brought to the curb stop and connected with that existing service, and everything's fine and dandy. We don't have to worry about the logistics of bringing that service all the way into the building. The challenge here is because of that, those buildings are right next to the right of way, we don't want to have a splice in different pipe materials out under the sidewalk, under a brand new sidewalk, out next to a street, so again, it needs to be brought into the building. So when I talk about assessments, we'll talk, we talk about in the street and then bringing it into the building. Oh, yes, thank you, yes. Um, yeah, we got into the details of the street. Yeah, the street, um, when we talked about wits and all that, yes, the street is right now planned to be concrete. So concrete uh, pavement, concrete curb and gutter, and obviously uh, concrete walk, so a lot of concrete. Adds a little more, some challenges in terms of construction, but it'll be a longer, more durable um, pavement, and it'll also help a little bit the heat island effect. It'll be cooler than having black top out on Main Street. But it's also important. It's also important to take a look at working with the property owners on the water and sewer replacement um, so that uh, those can be taken care of at the time of construction <coughs> versus if a property owner very critical to be working on with the properties. <coughs> Excuse me. And in some cases, uh, some of those things inside the buildings uh, are either under concrete or haven't been located or seen for a long time as well. Correct. Okay. Talk a little bit about detour and access. Um, and this is still yet to be fleshed out in detail, but I think this is where we where we've kind of dialed things in. Um, you're looking at, um, so again, how do we detour traffic that's passing through town, and how do we provide access to the businesses along and the properties along the street? Um, I think initial people initially think, well, let's just detour traffic on 13 and kind of route 2 to 21 and, and get them around town. Well, that's not going to serve properties within town. Um, we're looking at doing something so very similar to what St. Peter maybe did uh, during the Highway 169 project. If you've ever traveled through there during their construction where there was in one direction there was a detour. In this case, County Road 37, 19, and an eastbound detour, uh, 21, to County Road 29, to 3, or even up to up, uh, 10th Avenue southeast. Uh, Roadways, Columbus, First Avenue Southeast. Uh, the, the ones highlighted in yellow would be kind of the localized access, directing people to the businesses on the south side of Main Street, you name it. And obviously the, the, the blocks in between or the alleys providing access to the different blocks, et cetera, to get to Main Street. The other thing that we will require as part of the uh, contractor's contract will it be that they maintain cross access at all times at either First Avenue Southeast or at Columbus. So that traffic can get across north to south if they're not cut off or severed. So no, no matter what's happening at any given intersection, there'll be times when intersections will be open and people can cross the contract will allow uh, intersections to be open. But you know, at any one time, at least those, it, those uh, points of uh, access are, are open. Again, so we get people can get to the hospital, you name it, so those are open. And then again, the blues being some way to control getting people to the, the, the businesses and go on the street. So again, maintaining access. I, want, I just want to illustrate this picture again. This is from the St. James Project. Um, as you can see, all this construction traffic going on, <coughs> construction going on in the, in, within the roadway. The existing sidewalk is still very much in place. I think they're doing a utility service here. You can see railing was put up to keep pedestrians off the roadway. And if you look, you can see this blue line. That's the temporary water. And I think they 
They're connected to every service to these buildings. So they work around it until that point where it's time they have to connect that water service into the building, the sewer and water. And then there's a section of concrete that usually comes out. And actually, I'll go to my next photo. This was an illustration, and uh, again, every contract, every contractor is different, different project requirements. This is Nicollet Mall. This is way above what we'd be dealing with here. This was Red Wing. I guess there's really not illustrations here, but for example, when they do a water and sewer service, they'll just have to close a um, section of sidewalk temporarily, they make the connections, backfill, put gravel in, and then there'll be a piece of gravel walking surface again uh, to get to their businesses until that point when they actually need to do sidewalk. And then there's, we need to do sidewalks on weekends, after hours, and, and I, I doubt we'll see something like this, but in the case of Nicollet Wall, they had a bridge going over the sidewalk while they were uh, keep, keep accesses open. Again, where people have back doors, better yet, but not everybody's going to have that situation. So to talk about the big, uh, the big thing here is the cost of this project. Um, again, this is a proper project from Mindot and the city. Um, Mindot is the greatest share, and we'll show how that breaks out. This project's total project cost is estimated at uh, $12.1 million, so over $12 million. Roadway improvements itself, uh, just under $5.8 million, or 48%. Streetscaping, landscaping, and lighting, which really kind of fall under roadway as well, so what we call roadway eligible items. And I point that out because there's going to be a grant that will help cover a good share of this. About 2.7 million, about 22% of the project. Stormwater improvements, obviously a brand new road, all, basically all new storm sewer along the whole corridor, a little over $800,000. Sanitary sewer improvements, just under $900,000. Water system improvements, about 1.2 million. Uh, permanent and temporary easements, uh, 118,000 estimated. And then a bunch of uh, fiscal bonding and administrative costs, et cetera, go along with this, about $607,000. How this breaks down in the funding as estimated, okay, MnDOT again is the largest share of this, about 6.5 million over half the project. Uh, Sewer and Scott County have a small little segment of the project because each of their legs, uh, First Avenue Southeast is a Sewer County leg and Columbus Avenue is a Scott County leg. And under the MnDOT's policy, they contribute to a fourth of those intersections. Uh, they need about 80 some thousand dollars. Uh, there's a federal grant that the city applied for and received and it's all available in 2020, uh, just under so 1.77 million. Sanitary sewer funds covering the about six, 680,000. Um, again, just to compare this number to the number I had prior, the difference is sanitary sewer assessments for the, for the service laterals. Same thing with the water. So water, about $900,000. And a portion of that cost is covered by assessments, the rural or sewer and water costs. So assessments, just under 1.5 million or 12%, that's been estimated. And then the balance uh, will come out of city general levy or there's the opportunity to use some city state aid uh, funding, city, uh, can draw on to help pay for a portion of some of those additional remaining costs, I should say. So 12.1 million, a big number. Comparing it another way, um, neighborhood contribution, again, these are the assessments, 1.5 million. Citywide contribution, again, that's all those sewer water, sewer funds, water funds, stormwater fund, general tax levy, state aid. Uh, just over 2.2 million, 19% of the project. And then outside contributions, uh, federal, which is the federal grant, MnDOT and counties, just under 8.4 million, or about 69% of the project by, by those agencies. Gives us our total of 12.1 million. So I want to talk about assessments. 
point out that right now assessments are, well, we, historically we've been pretty pretty firm <coughs> when we, when we uh, come into the feasibility study of where assessments will be. Uh, they are preliminary at this point. Um, there will be an assessment hearing in the fall of 2020. There will be a lot of information that will go out. Again, the same some of the stuff that I'm going to uh, go over in summary. And there will be opportunities to uh, talk more about assessments at those times. So what I want to talk about is the city's assessment policy, policy and methodology and how we are proposing to do something slightly different on this project than in past projects. And what we're proposing is actually more than the vast majority of the property owners uh, favor. Um, if anybody's been involved in city projects in the past, we, every, every, all the assessments are based on a typical single family residential property. And for the basis of uh, description of the typical residential property would be 75 feet, kind of an average number. In street assessments in the residential property, so on the residential areas on the east end of Main Street or whatever project that we've done in the past, assessments have been one residential unit. Everybody pays the same regardless of property size, if it's resident. A single family residential property can't be subdivided. So in this example, one unit, one unit, one unit. When it comes to corner properties, if there's improvement on one side but not on the other, they get a half a unit here, and then someday in the future they get a half a unit on the other. If it happens to be a corner where both are being done, which isn't the case at all on this project, it's half a unit, half a unit, one unit for corner properties. Commercial properties have been uh, done in much the same way. For the larger properties, it was, it was looked at, well, how many typical 75-foot properties are there? two or three, they might be assessed multiple units. Um, some of the commercial properties uh, on this project have been assessed in the past and they were assessed at a unit or unit and a half again with that half of the unit credit on the corners in the past. What we're proposing to do on this project and the reason is, is there's so many properties that have small footages for their like 25, 30, 35 feet compared to your typical 75 foot property. It really didn't make sense to look at it on a unit basis. And so what we did is we have recommended, and this is how it's presented in the report, is to convert that unit rate to a front footage rate. So basically taking the what the residential assessment unit would be, divide by 75, and then taking that across that, um, that frontage. So whatever your frontage is, that would be the, the amount of the assessment. Corner properties would still be applied to corner credit up to 37 and a half feet. Unless it's a property that's only 37 and a half feet, then they would only they, they would have no reduction on their, on their corner credit. I should point out two commercial properties based on the city's policy and all projects in the past are assessed 30% uh, more than residential properties. They typically generate more more traffic and they benefit more from the improvements. That's the, the logic and, and, and how it's dealt with in most communities. So again, we would take, take the residential unit, divide by 75, we go with the front footage rate times 1.3 and then that's the rate. And we'll show what that is here coming up. So these are the rates, assessment rates that are estimated for 2020. Um, and I want to quantify the water and sur sewer water and, water and sewer service assessments because there's a lot of unknowns here and these will have to be reevaluated after we do the bids. We feel these are reasonable, we feel these are conservative, but until we really get down to actual numbers, these are a little harder to quantify up to 2020. So when I talked about kind of your typical typical property, most most of the water services out there today as they exist are probably some small three-quarter inch lines. Um, maybe there's, a lot of them are probably one inch, but a lot of them are probably three-quarter inch. Everything new going in will be one inch water services, which will be better. At least at least one inch. 
residential properties, buildings that are set back, and a lot of the properties that are out there today will just have a one inch water service stubbed out to the curb stop. Remember I talked about two, two parts. Well, stubbed out to the curb stop, we're estimating those assessments between 2,000 and 2,300 per unit. Um, for those that maybe need to extend beyond, uh, beyond the right of way and out into the building, we're probably looking something in the neighborhood of 2,600 to 3,000. Again, for the whole assessment, to bring it from the main up into the building. And again, and these are probably these are real rough until we get do some more homework to get more estimating these at this time. There'll be a number of properties that we know of today that will want uh, commercial water service, meaning a six inch, so that they can accommodate fire service in the building. Somebody wants to improve the building, you know, residential apartments, etc. They're going to want to take advantage of the opportunity to put in a, a larger six inch commercial service so they can tap in domestic and fire service. And those costs will certainly be more because it's bigger and more expensive infrastructure. We're expecting that to be between about $5,900 and $6,600 per unit. And again, we'll be sending information out to folks to find out who wants it. Um, and we've assumed on certain properties just by what we know. We've assumed those in some of the estimated assessments. Sanitary sewer service assessments between about 1,800 and 2,000 per property. And that's residential and commercial is pretty much the same. Street assessments. Um, again, we talked about the residential unit. There are residential properties on the western end of the project, or I'm sorry, eastern end of the project. Um, and those will be assessed at $8,500 per unit. And this is basically the assessment rate that was assessed on the last city project. Estimated carried forward by inflation, so it's basically the same amount uh, in magnitude uh, carried, out, carried out by inflation. By that $8,500 by 75 times 1.3, we get a rate, commercial rate of $147.33 per front for the commercial institution in multi-family property. So if you know what your frontage is, that's, that would be the street assessment. And this gives you an idea what the uh, water and sewer service assessments. And I should point out, uh, the feasibility study that was prepared is available online. You can, you can get a link to that through the project website. You can search <coughs> New Craig Main Street. Or you can go through the city's website. There's a link that gets you to the feasibility study. And there is a, a preliminary assessment role that is in the feasibility so you can actually look up your property specifically. Uh, you wouldn't expect any dramatic changes, again, other than you're just confirming what these sewer and water service things will be. And that will be after bids in uh, early 2020. <coughs> so yeah, I just wanted to point out, this is the image of the city's website. If you scroll down here to the bottom, you can, you can get to the feasibility report and the uh, preliminary assessment talk briefly about assessment process. Again, this will be presented again in fall of 2020. Um, again, everybody will be notified of their close assessment in fall of 2020. There will be a, um, official notices that go out. There will be, that will tell you how much each property owes. And the assessment hearing will be held in the fall of 2020. Um, following the city council's approval of assessments, there's a 30 day interest free period where a person, if they wish, they can pay a portion or all the assessment. A partial payment? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, the city doesn't have a partial payment process right now. Um, any unpaid balances or any the unpaid assessments that are just levied with the county after 30 days in there levied in November of 2020 and then they become payable with property taxes in 2021 over a period of 15 years. We don't know what the interest rate is at this point. We didn't know at that time and then it will be based on the interest rate that the city is able to sell the bond at. And historically the city's had very good bond ratings and very good interest rates on the market. So um, 
There is an option for deferred assessments on homestead and residential properties, so that really is very few properties that that would apply to. Again, there'll be more information on that um, coming up. Proposed schedule, we're here tonight, the public hearing. Um, we're anticipating uh, this project moving forward. We'll be working on um, detailed construction plans for about the next year. So uh, by this time next summer, we expect to have plans complete or nearly complete for MnDOT to do a final review and approval so that we can uh, get the project ready for bid by fall of 19. During this next year, we'll be having additional meetings. We'll have the information that goes out. We'll have questionnaires. We'll be meeting with properties, a number of properties one-on-one, -on -one, especially to talk about water and sewer, mostly water and services. Uh, we'll be con people be, property owners will be contacted about obtaining construction easements. Um, and we anticipate the project bidding in fall of 2019. Construction starting as early as possible in 2020, uh, with substantial completion being by fall of 2020. And when I mean substantial completion, there will certainly there'll be some work maybe left, but it'll be mostly clean up landscaping and some other things would like to hold. And I guess we're going on record. Um, the, uh, the intention <coughs> is to have the west end open to pedestrian traffic by September. 2020 for Dojing 2020. That's reasonable, barring a bunch of unforeseen circumstances. Just acknowledging the truth, uh, as it says, the truth about downtown projects. Really, this is a one in, once, in, once in a generation opportunity. Obviously, the last major project was when it was paved by concrete back in the 1930s and again in 1990 with the land streetscaping. We realize this is dirty, noisy, and inconvenience. Uh, surprises cost everybody money. That means the city and the property owners and MnDOT. So the more that we can find out during the next year, the better. We have done building, we'll call it building inspections for sewer, where sewer and water are located. We've done the most of the downtown building. But the more homework property owners can do in terms of looking at their plumbing, <coughs> sewer lines, water lines, and have an idea what they need to do, the better. Um, something jumped up. Um, again, we realize this is where people work and live, and uh, that uh, we need to make sure that we maintain access to the buildings to make this viable during construction. So. Um, I think I guess I went through all these again. Weekly meetings, we'll have we will have newsletters out on a regular basis, emails. I think we will get into things like text messages, so people have instant messages of what's going on. We'll have a project liaison or resident project representative on the project. Um, in these downtown projects, we've looked at holding like block meetings, uh, given time by a given business or whatever the, the business owner is. A lot can be done, and the biggest one is the business owners themselves and the chamber, and looking at different ways to promote people coming to downtown during construction. You know, I, I give an example. Um, Red Wing had what they call Hard Hat Thursday, where they promotional things to get people downtown during construction. So again, next steps: uh, get design over this next summer or next year. Additional meetings, I guess, and informational packets, questionnaires, one on one meetings, temporary construction easements, so we can find contact them for that. That's all I have. Questions for the council? Okay, well, thank you very much, Chris, for that. Does anyone on the council have any questions before we open for uh, open to the public? I have a quick one. Um, are you still planning on doing it in different, various segments, uh, like three block segments at a time, or? Yeah, let me I'll go all the way back to the beginning. That's a good, very good question. Um, we did. We actually met with a contractor who's done downtown projects just to get their idea. How would they look at a project like this versus what what uh, what we might uh, think ourselves? But oh, come on, one more. 
So the reality is the project will start down by the railroad. They actually start uh, down by Phillip Creek because that's where half to two thirds of the project will all drain down there. So you start at the bottom. The sanitary sewer veers off Main Street at Third Avenue. So again, they'll start at that location. So they'll definitely start at this end. Um, because the utilities, there's some utilities down here that flow east. And this contractor said they might even look at starting a second crew down on the east end versus another crew on the west end. And then one would work in the other one direction and one other in the other. The other thing they'd look at is maybe getting into one of these intersections, getting all the utilities in, getting it back on the drivable surface so they can get it opened up again. So it'll happen in phases, but we won't, it, we, you can't expect, the project won't be open to traffic, at least it'll be open to pedestrian traffic, maybe people, you know, as certain segments get done, people can get back, you know, from the side streets to get to the sidewalks to get to the businesses. But we won't have food traffic on the road during the whole duration of the project, car traffic. So hopefully that answers your, your question. It does. So. Hey Chris, the, the resurfacing uh, that 550 feet is that a MnDOT responsibility? Yes. Okay. Yes. So yeah, it's, it's, that's not in the scope of the 12 million. Uh, it is. It is. It is, but it's it's uh, it's totally funded by MnDOT. It's just the logical is to do it coordinated with this project. To do it. It'll be a building overnight, so it'll go relatively a day's worth of work or a couple days worth of work. There may be some concrete work on some of the curb, but that will happen ahead of time. Pretty quick duration, but we want to have it done so that there's a decent roadway out of town to the west. I just I want to go back one second. I did think of another question. So, if they do, when will we know if they're going to have two crews working? I mean, we won't know until we have uh, bid the project, um, um, have a contractor and work the contract, and actually have a meeting with them. Yeah, pretty much. So we would we wouldn't know until at NAS probably early twenty twenty. Okay. Um, we can direct things somewhat in the contract. But like we would say we would allow two crews as long as they maintain access to these crossover streets. And so if we give them certain parameters, we would allow two crews because two crews just mean they get the stuff done quicker. Okay. okay. A little more inconvenience, but a lot more, a lot quicker. So that helps in the end. How long did the St. James project take? Well, they theirs was uh, two seasons, or the majority of two seasons, but it was a lot longer project. Not not necessarily longer through their downtown. And again, I'll, this wasn't my one, an SEH or um, it was a MnDOT project, but they also bid it and started construction in the summer, so mid summer. So they did like started in July and then they wrapped up in fall the following year. So it was a little bit different different animal. What is the experience um, with having incentive deadlines? Um, does, it, does it work? Does it? Does it not? Does it? Um, uh, we haven't actually talked about it, but we haven't gotten <coughs> to that point yet. Um, I, in my past life, I did it pretty regularly. The only issue is you, you've got to have a lot of control over. Um, a lot of the unknown. So as soon as soon you've got a delay, then a lot of the delay is keeping you from earning the incentive. So it's uh, you know some utility delays it while well, that's delaying my incentive is arguing the contract will have. Um, it's something we can certainly look at if there's certain areas that are our priorities. But I, this is a reasonable project to do in the season, but it's 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 it's, it's, it's gotta be diligent. To get it done, and again, you want to get everything. You got to get that contract in and working hard to get it done as fast as possible. Any other questions from the council? Okay, I guess uh, right now I'm going to open the, the floor up to the public. Uh, if you'd like to make a comment or if you had a question or anything, please come to the podium. Uh, I would like to have, please ask if you would state your name and your address uh, so that we can have that for record. So. Right now, the floor is open. Mm -hmm. 
My name is my name is Isa Menhas, and I am the owner of uh, 401 West Main Street, which is on the corner. Um, uh, you know, this is a used car parking lot. It's about uh, 20. I mean, it's 60 by 120. Uh, the frontage is 120, and the depth of the lot is uh, 60. And I was told in my last meeting that I will be assessed $32,000 on this little puny lot. And um, and I was not comfortable with that. Uh, I mean, this thing is, uh, to me, is very unreasonable. The cost of the assessed value of the property is about $88,000. And then the city is going to assess me $32,000 for just a road, road improvement. So I need the council member to look into that and um, um, you know how we can resolve that issue. Because that's a that's disproportionate cost uh, to the property owners. Um, also, there's a I do have an access issue right now. There's two access to the property, and the Mindad was looking to reduce to one access to the property that would render this lot totally unusable. So uh, that's what I was working with with Nikki. Uh, for intern. so how we, hopefully we can resolve that issues because uh, in order to that in order to have these things viable property we definitely have to have two accesses because this uh, you know it's a narrow long lot um, yeah that's my concern okay Steve across 610 East Main Street, Project Funeral Home. Cost overruns or under budget? Who benefits or who pays? We get more of the grant, less of the grant, these other people that are paying in. There's overruns. Who, who's paying the overrun? Is it all the taxpayer? And if we're under budget, does the taxpayer benefit? Chris, do you want to? Uh, well, this project, as with all projects in the past, the uh, assessments are fixed. Okay, so does it, if the bids come in high or the bids come in low, the rate is, is fixed. The rate is fixed as it's been with all projects, and the idea being that the amount assessed is carried year to year, project to project. Uh, if there's a, again, fluctuation, most likely that's going to be in the, the, bot, the, bot, the bottom, uh, the bottom item I said was the general levy. That's the property taxes that everybody in the community pays or the sewer and water funds. That's where the, those will pick up the, the fluctuation. So um, again, it won't, there won't be a direct impact on the actual property owner the impact will be on MnDOT and then those other funds, the sewer, water, or general revenue. Chris, the grant is fixed. Uh, yes. That, uh, that amount we will get, uh, irrespective of the prices we've already got that, that's it in the bank, and so irrespective of where the cost fluctuates, we have that grant uh, and assurance you that we have that money. But to Steve's point, is that it, what these preliminary assessments are, are not going to change is what we're kind of, I mean, they'll change based on actual cost, but. It could on the water and the sewer services, but the cost for the street assessment, as Chris said, is generally fixed. If, if there's something less than that, then uh, again, I'm not expecting that uh, you're, you know, we know that complete answer at the present time, and we've done that with each and every street project is you've had a fixed cost historically over the last uh, um, since the early 2000 uh, in the same process. So uh, we can't say that uh, the assessments are going to go up or down and that uh, uh, at, at this time it was uh, approximately fixed money. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, no other comments? Then I guess I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. 
Second. Second by Dave Bruchik. Uh, all in favor closing the public hearing say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, the public hearing is closed. Okay, next is uh, the resolution. Uh, Mike, is this uh, the first one? Is the actually the resolution going forward? Yeah. Uh, next item. Sorry. Excuse me. Uh, the next item on your agenda is the uh, uh, ordering the uh, preparation of uh, plans and specs. So we yes, ask the resolution. Um, so uh, just to point out again, the, the feasibility study was ordered here in, uh, back in October. And uh, we held a neighbor meeting in, in, in you know, a number of public meetings, but a neighbor meeting in August. Brought the report to the council at the last meeting and, and basically ordered the, the, the public hearing. So, uh, next for consideration is the uh, resolution ordering the improvement and preparation of plans. Anyone have any questions for Chris on that? If not, I guess I'll look for a motion to approve the resolution. So moved. Second. Is that you, Sean? Okay, I got a motion by Sean and I, a second by Maggie Bass. Any other comments or questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, passes 5 0. The next resolution looks like it's the joint powers agreement for phase two. Uh, that's correct. Mayor. So um, just briefly, uh, the, this is a joint powers agreement for phase two, very similar to the joint powers agreement that the city council approved for phase one. This is uh, basically uh, to uh, prepare the final construction documents, final design. Um, this is again the joint powers agreement between MnDOT and the city for professional technical services. Um, there's a full scope of work that's listed there. Um, here's exhibits A and B that outline that scope of work and the uh, be involved. That is what we call the MnDOT. I call it MnDOT task, it's a MnDOT scope. Um, again, this is, uh, these are pass, basically pass through costs. MnDOT will be reimbursing the city for, for that portion of the contract. Um, and then, not to jump ahead, but the second part of the other agreement is the Exhibit C, which is the city task. That's the portion of the sewer and water improvements. That's, that's a city only cost. So to differentiate that from what's that listed in that joint powers agreement. Those are both of them, are Yeah, the full agreement, which is kind of the next, next, Again, not to jump ahead, the consideration for professional services with SEH lists the exhibits A and B, which are part of the joint powers agreement, as well as exhibit C, which is the city task, which are, are related to the sewer and water things, that are not in the joint powers agreement. Again, those were put together in the SEH agreement all in one. Again, back, back, and back up to the joint powers agreement. That's just your the agreement between the city and MnDOT. Right. Those, that scope of services that MnDOT is asking the city to to uh, to lead. And that's the eight hundred ninety-seven thousand. And those are going to pass through pass through costs from MnDOT to the city and the SEH. Mike has Scott reviewed all these documents. <laughs> you didn't have to bring the email. I, I, I would trust. I just. This was pretty much Okay. Anyone have any questions regarding the joint powers? Yeah. Chris, in this 
joint powers, it appears that there's an awful lot of reports that have to be sent to MnDOT. Are you going to do that, or does Nikki have to do it? <laughs> Nikki and her team, uh, our, our, all of our highway design group, they're a lot more familiar with working on MnDOT at this level. So. And, and, and sore hands. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <coughs> None, I guess I'll look for a motion. So moved. Second. And a motion by Dave Brugic, second by Sean Ryan, to approve the Joint Powers Agreement for Phase 2 of this project. There's no other comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, passes 5-0. And now the next one is a consideration is a motion that to the services with SEH to perform these, correct? Yeah, and I should point out that none of this work will take place until the final Joint Powers Agreement is executed. So, once the mayor and, and uh, administrator sign the document, it'll go to MnDOT for final execution, and then at that point, we're, from MnDOT's standpoint, we're authorized to, to begin that work. So yeah, as I pointed out, again, the exhibits A and B is the MnDOT task, exhibit C is the city, city only or the sewer and water related improvements, um, all compiled into one agreement. Okay. Any questions regarding to that? If not, I guess I'll look, a motion, uh, look for a motion to approve the uh, ser engineering service agreement with SAH. So moved. Second. I got a motion by Amy Jurek, second by Maggie Bass. Any other comments, questions? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, pass. Five zero. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have a quick question for either Chris or Nikki. Uh, could you answer Mr. Minas's question? Was there going to be two at this point? Or are you going to close one access of his? We're still in negotiations with MnDOT on that, so. Okay. So that was MnDOT. determined. That was MnDOT pushing that? Yeah. Okay. So do we have a say in that? I mean, can we either agree or disagree with that, or depending on? I wish you would have stuck around. I was hoping mm -hmm. to get to that question. Well, I don't know that we can provide a final answer tonight. No, but I, I just was knowing the process. We have been working uh, on various uh, accesses as to whether we agree with them or disagree. Uh, but in the end, it ultimately will be the Dutch final call since it is a state highway. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Glenn, I think you must be next on the, the docket. <coughs> Right, you got the still a nice rule of maintenance agreement with MnDOT. Uh, we do this every two years. It's summer. It's summer, so we shouldn't even talk about it. <laughs> we right just got time shovels. I agree. <laughs> yeah, we did about five weeks ago. Um, the agreement is the same as we've had for the last uh, three times with this agreement. Um, it used to be back in the day that MnDOT wanted us to keep track of all the time that was spent out there and then turn in basically a timesheet and they paid us for that. And then they changed that uh, six years ago to just start paying us a lump sum per year to do this snow removal. The snow removal just means pulling the snow off the main street. It does, does nothing to do with hauling the snow off of it. It's wind rowing it and blowing it into trucks. Um, they've always been very clear that they're not paying for hauling. Um, they've always been very clear with us that we're supposed to be the only city that they still do this with. So uh, every time we get this agreement, we're, we feel pretty good about it. Um, we, I talked to uh, MnDOT about it. Um, I never even asked for any more money than $4,200 per year. If you look on the back of, your, uh, of the memo, it, it kind of gives you a little history. Last year, or this last spring, uh, really kind of blew these numbers out of the water. But the nine-year history uh, really shows that we're we're staying right in line there. I mean, it, it seems to always work out. One year is you know, pretty easy, and the next year we probably pay a little bit more to do the snow. So uh, after uh, uh, reviewing it with uh, Mike and talking about it, we decided to recommend that we'll keep the same price, $4,200 a year for another two years. As Mike said, the contract would start November 1 of 2018, and would expire on June 30th. 
2020. It is recommended recommendation of staff to approve the two years snow and ice removal agreement. Okay. Any questions? I know none of us want to talk about it, so uh, I'll make a motion to approve the, the two year agreement. Second. Second by Dave Brugic. If there's no other comments, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. James, your floor. Good evening. Honorable Mayor, Council, tonight I'm here to uh, ask for an appointment of a police officer. Um, Mr. Jensen was involved in the hiring process for the last couple of months. Um, upon completing his background check, the traditional offer was made to him. Uh, Mr. Jensen was raised in Springfield. Minnesota. He graduated from Springfield High School. He received a Bachelor Degree of Arts uh, in Criminal Justice at Gustavus Adolphus College. Mr. Jensen completed his law enforcement skills training through Mankato State University. At Mankato, I'm sorry, Minnesota State University at Mankato. Um, he started with the Waseca County Sheriff's Office as a dispatcher in November of 2003. And he worked in that position for approximately two and a half years and then was promoted to a deputy sheriff in March of 2006 and have continued to serve in that capacity. Because of Mr. Jensen's experience, training, demeanor, and personality, he will make a great addition to the New Prague Police Department. Uh, I believe he'll serve the citizens of New Prague in a professional manner with integrity. Um, I would recommend that Hunter be appointed as a police officer to the police officer position with an effective starting date of June 10th, 2018, um, starting at level two in our pay schedule, uh, which is indicated on the memo, and then also um, at step two for vacation with 72 hours vacation. Uh, the recommendation is to appoint Mr. <coughs> Hunter Jensen as a police officer per the rec recommendations listed above. Okay. It's good to see that we didn't tap into Waterville again. <laughs> I think I would have probably been uh, chastised a little bit if that would have happened. But, uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. David? I thought we were going to get a chance to meet him. You know we don't bite. So. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll bring him back for swearing in. Okay. But, um, if you want to do that, we can work on that. No, I'm just hoping to meet the guy. So. Oh, the, the, the timing of what goes on in this process is uh, the notification uh, uh, to make sure that uh, he gets hired and that he's able to carry out the process. Right. That brings us to nine full time. Is that her? How many officers? Oh, we have 10 full time. Yeah. And we're back up to full staff. And then who is he replacing? I can't remember which one left. Uh, well, we lost three last year. Mm -hmm. So we have not been the whole staff since last May 15th. Yeah. Um, so the question was before those three, who was the gentleman? Uh, uh, Lee Mortensen was the one that left mm -hmm. most recently. Okay. Um, he was mm -hmm. going through training and, and decided to move on. Okay. Did, um, he was fairly new, right? Or, yes. Or just a year or two? Yeah. Is there, um, did we do an exit interview or was there a particular reason that he left? Or um, he didn't? It was just based on his, his skill set. He was new into law enforcement and just didn't feel that this was a good fit for him. Okay. Um, and not necessarily the department, uh, more law enforcement at this time. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. Okay. Any other questions? No, I just want to point out that uh, Mr. Jensen has uh, 12 years as a County Sheriff, County Deputy. So that certainly is uh, puts us, him in good stead with with the force, yeah. having that much experience. Yeah, it would be a good addition to to his experience. Um, also, he's committed to law enforcement with that role. Any other questions or comments? Uh, so I look for a motion to 
Approve the appointment of Hunter Jensen. So moved. Second. Is that you, Maggie? Yeah. Okay, I got a motion by Maggie Bass, second by Dave Brujek. There's no other comments, questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, passes 5-0. Well, good luck. Welcome. Make sure he comes and visits us. I will do that. Hey, Bruce. Attached to in your packet, there's a photo that shows the location of the proposed increased facilities commission distribution feeder line, First Avenue Southeast to 10th Avenue Southeast. There's an, as you can see on the map, there's an existing easement on the private property up to the golf course property. And then from the golf course property to the east, the land is owned by the city, but no easements have existed on that, and necessitating the need for the easement to be put in place. The drainage and utility easement for the underground facility is for underground facilities only and for city purposes, not utility companies in general. Uh, the planning community director and I drafted the easement document and the city attorney reviewed and approved the attached. Um, the city attorney noted that the council approval is necessary by a motion to approve the easement document. The easement document will be reported by the sort of time. I know it seems kind of ridiculous to ask the city to give a easement for the city, but nonetheless, that's a, how we need to do it, just in case anything ever changes in the future, so that those uh, utilities and other time and, and uh, property easements are given. I would ask that the city council approve granting the declaration of the utility Any questions? I guess I'll make a motion to approve the uh, drainage and utility easement. Second. Second by Amy Jurek. If there's no other comments or questions, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, passes five zero. Are you taking the next one? No, Mike's gonna take that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll I'll help him out. <laughs> Thanks. I think we should lower the dollar amount that we have in the paragraph down. What you have in front of you is a resolution that uh, declares the official intent of the city to uh, reimburse itself for certain expenditures from the proceeds of tax exempt bonds or other obligations and establish and establish procedures for additional declarations of uh, official intent. Recall with the uh, recent uh, acquisition of the territory by the uh, right, uh, Utilities Commission for the expansion of the electrical territory within the city. One of the things that they have to do is to uh, install uh, underground electric equipment and meters and, and other items. All this action is doing is it's, it's preserving our abilities that uh, they have funds on hand, but if they prioritize. Uh, additional capital projects and budgets going forward, which we have some plans, is this is just giving us the ability, should we decide to, uh, at a later date, uh, if they take, take out a capital uh, project uh, of a uh, new building or something of that, of that other magnitude, instead of spending cash reserves, if we've got the ability to go back into uh, the bond for, uh, for that at a later date. So it's a declaration uh, while preserving the ability to bond, but not saying that we are going to bond. So uh, this is uh, recommended by our financial advisor and our bond council. And so as you can see it is that the, the maximum amount of principal estimated the uh, finances about $500,000 for territory uh, uh, infrastructure. And then there's provisions in there should that uh, ever need to be, uh, uh, the declaration need to be expanded of the official intent that sets forth the procedures uh, that somebody in my position will have Utilities Commission took action to preserve this, but uh, ultimately the financing and bonding authority rests with the City Council, so the Council needs to take action just to uh, adopt this. So they want to use the City's ability to bond, <coughs> that, which this would give them the okay to, but then ultimately they could decide on themselves to use 
they could choose going forward. Uh, any money that they would do would still come back before the council. They're not going to go off and do this on their own. I thought they, they acted independently of the. They, they have certain abilities to act independently, but under city charter, <coughs> the abilities to ultimately issue bonds requires council. Okay. So all this is. is I just want to make sure we didn't approve it now, and then two years from now they decide on their own that they're going to go out. No, they. they any binding that they would put together all has to come through the city council at a future point. What this is, is this is just putting the, to preserve our abilities as we issue tax exempt bonds and following all the IRS rules and regulations as we're declaring an intent. Whether we exercise that intent is another story. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments for Mike? Okay. Now I guess I'll look for a motion to approve this resolution. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Amy Jurek, second by Sean Ryan. If there's no other comments, questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, passes 5-0. Next, Fitness Center. Well, we have with us some special guests in the audience, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, Acknowledging the framework of the one of them, uh, we, just did. we already <laughs> concerned that, uh, that she has another meeting that she was obligated to go to. Tim's not on the driving range, that's kind of scary. <laughs> that, that would have been very clip. Uh, Heather will, uh, Heather Teets from Mayo you know, is also here tonight, as well as uh, school superintendent uh, Tim Dipper. Uh, what you have in your packet of uh, materials on this agenda item tonight. Uh, is uh, the, the summary of the uh, discussion items that the council asked city staff to go back and talk with the, the school district uh, about and obtain uh, additional information. And, uh, for those that haven't watched this or aren't aware of this, is that if we go back in time a bit, uh, we've been working with the school district and the joint powers uh, and we coordinated the uh, discussions on this at a special meeting. Uh, that was held in a, in a joint fashion with the school district on May 14th. Uh, the council had a discussion on May 21st, uh, asked us to go get some answers, and so then the school board met on May 29th, and so what we've attempted to do is to bring back additional information for you uh, that's included in your, your packet. You, you also have at your dais tonight is a one piece that was not included, uh, it didn't come in until late Friday after we had the packets all put together and that was the uh, projected forecast of the uh, indoor aquatics for 2018-19, uh, that fiscal year with the school district as well as uh, the estimated impact of incorporating a full year of a fitness budget. Uh, Likely this won't be up and running on a July 1 uh, basis, uh, even if you made the decision, but it shows you what uh, a full year basis is based on the preliminary conceptual budget estimates uh, that have been assembled by uh, the school finance director, school business manager. Um, so in your packet is, we attempted to identify the, uh, identify the questions that you had posed to us and assuming <coughs> our minutes and our interpretation of the questions you uh, raised at the uh, May 21st meeting, we've attempted to go back and to gain answers to the, the financial questions, the parking, uh, uh, the uh, um, daycare issue, the uh, language uh, on the joint powers, uh, even though it's not complete, what that would be modeled after or look like. Membership information, uh, the safety integration with the school district facilities, um, and then we uh, attached a copy of the school board minutes from their May 29th meeting where they actually uh, took action and approved on a six to one uh, vote uh, to uh, a favorable vote to move forward with the fitness center proposal with the city and the mayor subject to uh, what the council does. And then uh, I think it was council member Bruja had sent me an email in the school, uh, an email about an article that uh, was in the Star Tribune, and uh, this was shared with the Joint Powers Board, and I think the school board saw it on uh, uh, an article that was on May uh, 20, 
May 29th, uh, just a, a, a more of a metro uh, article, but it talked about uh, modern athletic facilities are a boon for school districts and their communities, just showing how there's a, an ongoing partnership between cities and schools uh, trying to modernize athletic facilities for the benefit of the community and providing for public participation in use of those facilities. So uh, it's nothing more than just a, an attachment as a, a piece similar to what we've been talking about. So Mayor, I don't know where you want to start, uh, whether uh, the council uh, has questions about the materials that have been provided or whether you've got additional questions tonight. Uh, the piece that we handed out was the, the revised updated budget projections with the two together, or whether you have any more questions for our guests and audience tonight. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? Um, when do we anticipate to look at the joint powers agreement uh, and make any changes? Is it going to be a separate agreement, Mike? Is there going to be two agreements, or are we going to... Likely, we would attempt to, if we can, if you hold on, let's go take a look at the language in that page. Uh, and if I'm talking out of school, I'll let Tim come to the, to the podium. But I, I believe the intent would be, would be to attempt to incorporate that into the existing joint powers agreement, and that if the council was wanting to move forward, that we would modernize that partnership along the lines of what you see under the operation of the indoor pool facility, using that as an outline and as a concept of how we would attempt to put that together. But as this has moved in the discussion stages, we obviously haven't had time to sit down and talk with any of the legal counsel that pending seeing where maybe the council or the school district wanted or school board wanted to go in that process. So all I could do is on the, the basis of what we have there is we've identified uh, the general arrangement as to how we work on the indoor pool. I think the uh, superintendent's uh, perspective is, is that uh, the partnership in this fitness arena, as you can see from the preliminary budget that's in there, revenues minus expenditures, is uh, if it's positive uh, on the one hand, that would get applied to the joint coordination of the indoor aquatics and the fitness center. Uh, obviously, if it did not, uh, pass muster and, and hit budget, obviously that would result in the likelihood of some cost sharing on a 50-50 basis. Is that uh, a fair description, Tim? Yeah, I think you did a good job there explaining that. I would just say, um, when you talk about the time frame, if we move ahead, uh, uh, if you do approve the proposal today, I would probably say in the next month, um, maybe at your second June meeting after, like, when I said legal counsel, make sure they look at everything. And I would say June or, you know, early July would be able to have all, all done. Well, well, Penny, the direction is whether the, obviously one of the next steps would be to sit down and try to draft the language for the joint powers agreement that would be presented to the school. Okay. But well, there's no sense trying to guess what all that's going to be if the council wasn't interested in moving forward, and whether you do that as a contingency or do that for the final language, or are you willing to move forward subject to developing appropriate language in that, in that respect? And that's what I was getting at. I mean, I think we should have that language before we overall approve it. And, and that has been your choice. The school board chose to, right. you can see in their materials, they chose to move forward necessarily without that needing to be in place based, uh, I think, on the concept that I've just described, I think is how you can explain it to, to the school board next time. Yes. And just, you know, do the sort of the timeline for construction of the end of the people sometime in the fall. Mm -hmm. Would you start that construction, Tim, before, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is yeah. if the city did not participate with this, with the school district still move forward on the on the project because you have the funds. I can't so. answer that right now. I will. Okay. We have discussed that as a school board. I mean, it's my hope that we continue to work together uh, jointly on this, and that if it's approved in May, um, I, I I think uh, you know we talked about just making uh, modernizing or whatever you want to call it uh, to the joint powers. I don't think it's 
going to be a lot of language changes or language additions to it. Mm -hmm. We have the concept that. Well, there are some things though that we that I that I'd like to see, and one is, you know, we're on the hook for. Um, I mean, we're, we're you know the school board wants us to participate 50-50 now, but yet we still are on the hook for 100% of new equipment and upgrades and equipment, and every we don't know what that's going to be. If that's one every every two years or three years. Every well, year. they put twenty five thousand in. We put that in the budget. budget. In the yeah, right. In, Correct. In the fitness budget that was included in there. If you remember, that was a question that was posed to the, and so they went back and then they redid the budget, and that's kind of what lowered the projections from what it was to ensure that there was capital replacement. Right, 25000 Right. But, but we spent eighty initially, if I remember right. Was it the umbrellas were, the umbrellas, the wet bikes, everything else was about 80000 But that was on the, the aquatic center uh, side. That was on the aquatic center side. Right. Right. But I mean, that should be something that we look at as well. If we're going to partner in this thing, no, that, that is figured in. That was looked at as to what the uh, our contribution, our contribution yeah. would be on the startup where they're doing proposing that they would do the 110, and ours would be at 90,000. There was recognition given for that contribution on the indoor aquatics. Yeah. Right, but it. So the total would be 45,000 at the with the. The 25 in the budget and the 20 that am I not? What am I not getting? The okay. math doesn't the, seem to be working. The, 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 what what Tim has identified on behalf of the school and taking a look at working with the contractor to renovate the school facilities yeah. to accommodate the uh, the fitness cardio uh, weight room on the back side of that gymnasium that I think you uh, two were to, to see that we're trying to redo the two classrooms upper part of the building that have access from the south parking lot. Uh, I don't know that there's a whole lot more renovations needed in the community room, but between those two major renovations, I think the estimate is $200,000 is, is what he's looking at. So the cost here on the capital construction is about one ten versus ninety to do that. Right, that's the $20,000 difference, right? They're, they're, we're paying $20,000 less. Yes, right. to do that. The school is proposing to do it on 110. Okay, yes, I understand that. Right. Then when you take a look at the annual operating budget, most all of the equipment is coming over from Mayo, right. with the exception of a few pieces that are kept for therapy. Uh, those have to be all identified and, uh, and what have you. And when there was discussion, Mary at the last meeting talked about or answered the question from the mayor about whether there was any capital replacement included. There was not. So they've gone back trying to take a look at that and enter, uh, including within the annual operating budget about 25000 for capital replacement of any of the um, cardio machines and, and right. those kinds of things. I, I understand that. What I'm, what I'm getting at, though, in the joint powers is on the aquatic side. We, the way the language reads now, on the aquatic side, we are responsible for if we have to get new climbing walls or new widgets or bouncy jumpy toys or new wet bikes for the physical therapy part of the aquatic center, that's a hundred percent us. That's and we spent eighty thousand even for the umbrellas and what you're saying a replacement of those on, I will, in the joint powers I think we should if we're gonna partner in this entire thing, that should be fifty fifty as well because we know that in we we, rec we don't know but we assume that if we get three to five years before that those widgets and whatnot had to be replaced and that would be an additional eighty thousand i think if we're going to partner 50 50 that should be something that we look at in the budget that that the school board can pay half of that the upkeep maintenance of the aquatic center as well I, yeah i believe it is any any cost that we have in the aquatic center from now on is okay that's and i just want to make sure but no. it doesn't state that it's it's right 50-50, okay. make sure it's in. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Heather, I got a question for you. Um, had, what kind of feedback have you, you know, been getting uh, from existing fitness members? And I'm sure it's, since it's been in the paper and it's been on the radio and everywhere, uh, just kind of, if, if you have a little handle on, on, on some feedback, Sure, we have. Um, 
Mary has received some emails and we've been responding to each of those that have come in. Um, actually, it's mostly people don't have all of the information, so once we're able to clarify that, um, have been getting statements like we have, you have our full support. I think again, our me from our members' perspective, the biggest concern was, one of two biggest concerns was our staff. So they were very concerned, but the school has made it very clear that they intend to um, try to bring out as many people as possible to carry on that same level of customer service and variety of classes. I, I think very positive, once people learn, um, you know, the questions that they have, it's been very positive. But again, I'd say the overwhelming thing was take care of our people. Okay. And I agree, I think, uh, you know, if, if we go forward, I think we need to do some kind of communication device to make sure that the people know what's going on because, you know, lack of communication hurts more than anything, so. Absolutely, and I think that came up in our joint powers too. Um, communication is kind of key, it can be your greatest asset and your worst enemy. So I think over communication is gonna be really important, so. Okay. Tim, question for you again. Um, in regards to uh, how do you envision the the structure of the management? Uh, you know, right now I know Craig is kind of looking over the facilities. You know, got that given that to him, and you know, and I think you have someone temporarily doing some doing the actual pool management. You know, now that you got if, if you encompass the fitness center in there, uh, are, are you seeing that you're going to have someone overseeing both of them? Uh, um. Craig most will still oversee the entire operation, but we'll have a, a aquatics manager or supervisor that we have now, which we made a reduction in uh, with salary, and we have an equal one that will oversee the fitness side. And being as big a building as it is, too, uh, there would be some overlap of duty between the two, too, just mm -hmm. because it, there's a lot going on. And, and there are fitness classes in the aquatic side, too, so the, the fitness person would be charged, along with other part-time people. But uh, uh, to be able to make this work and to uh, at least you know, make the budget, um, you know, we're just looking at really one full-time fitness person. Not to say there won't be some part-time people, uh, you know, an hourly wage type of thing to help fill in mm -hmm. onto the hours. But we won't have uh, extended the staff that they had currently at the fitness Okay. And just to answer to it, just on the communication side too, is if this is approved tonight too, is uh, Heather will be uh, males uh, agreed to have her work in the transition. A big part of hers is communication, marketing, staffing, and so she'll be leading the transition team and uh, working 20 hours a week uh, in our building to make sure we have a successful, uh, smooth transition. Okay. So Heather, a lot of the, the instructors who do the classes, are those just part-time? Very part-time, and actually most of them are per diem. So they're okay. less than a point, point oh one, I believe. Okay. So, yeah. Yep. And we have approximately 18 to 20 of those right now. Okay. And those all have been versed on what's going on. And Absolutely, yep. I know that was Mary's biggest push at the start of this all. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Well, just in regards to the duplication of services, do we have a a um, some type of job description for the supervisor of the fitness center? I still find that I still think that we could have just one manager oversee the entire facility. I, I don't understand why we need both sides. I, I, and I voice that at the joint powers. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's my biggest concern. And then the other thing is, is because with that position and the benefits that go along with it, it eats up a, more than the what's fallen to the bottom line to help offset our deficit. Yeah, and we, we discussed that, um, Craig Wilson, and Sandy Lynn, and, and uh, Mary and Heather, and we just don't think uh, one person would be able to do the job. We'd have one person at a Obviously, we have to pay a much higher salary, but I, we don't think there's enough hours in the day for that person to be able to do it and be successful with it. We already have two people at a lower, lower salary to do that. And I think uh, I think uh, even with that, I know what you're talking about benefits, but I still think uh, it fits within our budget. I think we're we'll being fiscally responsible for that and we'll be more successful. We've got to be careful that we don't 
you know, when you talk about you know customer service, for example, a fitness center, that you know we can, we've got to be able to meet those expectations, and I think we we struggle if we get we get to. And I think the advantage too with Heather coming in and helping us out, I think she can almost you know help on the aquatic side too. How how do we better market that uh, facility? I don't think we've done a very good job uh, on, from that standpoint. Uh, I think you know we have an asset there that we need to let people be aware of. Absolutely. And I think with the partnership of both the you know thing and, and coming up with a good marketing plan. Uh, to, you know, I, I noticed there's a couple thousand or four thousand dollars in the budget for marketing, but you know uh, it, that you know we need to, to look at make sure we spend at least that, and because I, you know uh, you look at it, we're just going to be fighting with the uh, rest of the, the fitness centers in town, and we need to make sure that um, we have a, a facility that can service their needs, but also uh, service the whole community. Yeah. And this is, I think there's a big difference. I know Maggie, um, which I don't understand fitness just like I did. This is a different niche. It's a different, right. uh, it, it's a different need because it's more of a full, it'll be more of a full service fitness center than uh, any time or a staff fitness. So, you know, people have choices and uh, it's not, I would, you know, it doesn't uh, duplicate, I think, compete really because it's all different brands. Well, I think we can brand it as, as a really a, a community center. Oh, yeah. And I think, you know, when we started looking at the indoor pool, we had, you know, people, uh, why aren't you looking at the YMCA and all that stuff? And, and at that time, uh, you know, they said, well, none of those organizations will look at you unless there was, I think, like 13,000 population in your community and things like that. So uh, to, to be able to come up with something uh, that this looks like it could be a community center, I, I think we're very... It, that's what it's turned into. That's what it's turning into. And uh, that article you were talking about, I mean, school districts, uh, facilities, uh, you know, nowadays you go around the state with that article said, meet the needs of uh, people in communities. And I, I look at it this way. When we talk about the aquatic center and the whole bond referendum process, we talk about the cradle of dream that it's, it's for everyone. And people that voted to approve uh, this bond referendum, we want to be able to let them, you know, obviously use this building. Whether it's for, could be for anything, wrestling, basketball, on the athletic side, but also on this portion of the district, uh, we want to be able to uh, make it open for everyone. And, you know, one of the things that it hasn't even been talked about is the gymnasium there, too. We want to be able to still have adaptive sports in there, which are very important to us, and obviously we have pickleball there, but for as much as possible to be able to open it up, have that open for people to come in that have memberships to play catch with the kid or shoot baskets or play volleyball, something like that. So we're trying to truly make it, one of the things too is just a walking trail, uh, mail mile that we'll have going through the building too to make it popular too. Well, I was just gonna mention too, I wanted to reiterate again, Sean, to your point, um, you know, that um, the retention of the existing members we have and once we get new members that buy into this this whole plan and now it's more um, uh, it's more appealing to them because it fits all of their family needs versus having to choose now between one or the other pieces absolutely I will say over and over that my experience in this realm is retaining the members that you have and that's a really big part of that fitness manager fitness supervisor's role is that um, retention piece and so there's so much that has to go on it isn't just selling the membership and saying hey thanks show up you know there's so many pieces that have to go into it whether it's reprogramming them from the fitness perspective or keeping them challenged with some of our free challenges that we do to hold them accountable i would say most probably one of the top things that our, our members would say or why they do challenges if you go there now we're doing a free challenge which we do quite frequently it's it's a hundred day a hundred mile challenge for the summer because everybody drops out their fitness in the summer right so we try to keep incorporating some of these free programs to go oh, I'm not getting my sticker on my thing and the fitness center people are going to know I didn't do it and they will check in with you to say hey we haven't seen you in a while what do you, you know can we help you and things like that there's so much of that that's such an important piece of this because it's a lot easier to keep an existing member than find new ones to replace them so that's where the bigger emphasis. No, and, I, and I think to that point, we saw that um, the former aquatics manager was really overtaxed 
um, in his responsibilities. And I think that customer service piece was, was lacking um, very much so. And, um, and, and a quad facility and a fitness center are two different animals and they have to be marketed differently. They have to be approached differently because it's a different type of a workout. It's a different type of a member experience. Um, so I, and, and I think as Sandy Lynn had pointed out, it is at will employment. So if for some reason down the line, there's you know, some reason that we feel that one person can do the whole job, we're not locked in. Which is good because the, the thing that does scare me about that whole thing is that once we, if we don't change the language in the joint powers is that we really, I mean, that employee is, is a school district employee. Correct. And we don't have the ability to make those changes as a city council, although it's relying on city funds at a 50-50 disbursement. And it kind of takes some of the budget areas out of our control. Right. And that's the thing that worries me. And there's, uh, so, um, I mean, yes, I, I heard Sandy in that meeting too say that they're at will and if we as a joint powers, but that's just a re recommendation that goes to Tim or whatever else. If they decide they don't want to do that, they take it off. All of a sudden there's more and more expense, which we're on the hook for, and they're spending city money. But and, I, but, go ahead, I'm sorry, no, go no, no, ahead. I, and I, so what I wanted to say is, for example, there's uh, and the things that just worry me or that would keep me up at night are, you know, there's a custodian chargeback fee, $7,500, which I understand. I mean, people have to clean that up and they have to, you know, we need a custodian there but how do you know we don't get to control any of those secondary costs um, you know the business office charge back for, for Sandy Lynn's time uh, doing the books and whatnot that's all school board or the school district and they control that but yet we're still when the, everything falls to the bottom line we're on those are expenses that we're right right subsidizing now, and we're out of control and we don't have the control to say anything different that's right. where i think the language should change a little bit in the joint powers to give the joint powers some type of ability or a city council that might not be any of us 10 years from now the ability to say hey hold on right. and and i think that you're on the right track there that it, it should stay at the uh, joint powers committee level to maybe have more input in in some of those decisions or or the budget, you know, um, because we haven't had that in the past. And uh, when the previous manager came on board, um, we weren't part of that process, and, and understandably so. So I mean, if the joint powers uh, agreement is going to be amended, then maybe we can address some of those disparities and at least allow us have more voice. Thank you. I hope the rest of the council agrees with that too. Well, oh, I, I think so. And I think Tim probably does. I, I think we do a pretty good job listening and we get changes for the budget. I, and I'm not implying that you don't. All okay. I want to say is that it's a little scary for it's, us. I, I fully totally understand, but it's still 50 50. And if we knew how much work was uh, involved in this whole, I mean, never did I think we were going to go into fitness center business that it was, as no one did. No one, whether it's Sandy, me, whatever, um, but uh, we're doing the best we can, and, and we can, uh, Sean, the stuff you're talking about, we can, we can take a look at that, and again, we'll give you a council look at the stuff, but, you know, the main thing is it is still 50-50. You know, we're making changes, we've made changes in the past. I'm very optimistic with this, even though it's, I still say it's a very conservative projection by Sandy, but uh, we have to change the way we're doing business people. We are short on the membership uh, category for revenue. And it's because basically people are not going to watch a bowl, the fitness center and the aquatic center. But if, if people can get both for the same price uh, and then other new people, I think it can be very successful. And like, like you mentioned, Chuck, this is, it is turning into a, a true community center too. I see this as a step that neither the school nor the city are really into. This is not our business, but I think it's a good learning experience for both of us. And I look at this as a big benefit to our citizens. So that even if somehow 
the dollars aren't coming out even right now. We have the ability to, if we have to, change the joint powers agreement at some point in the future. It's strictly agreement between the city and the school, and like anything else, you can change it. So I don't see this as a big issue right now. I see us both as moving forward with this to ultimately help the residents of this community. I think it's a wonderful option, a wonderful uh, thing for us to take over what mail can no longer do. So I, I see it as a win-win for everybody. And my opinion is I'd like to move forward this with this effort. And I know there's going to be issues coming up, but we'll work those through as long as we have the desire to do so. And I think we all feel that way. So. Yeah. Any other comments? Kind of quiet. I am. <laughs> but I agree with David. Um, I know that's a, a, just personally, it's been a hard choice to decide between the aquatic center and, and the fitness center. So, or, to me that works out and it also makes it easier for both families and generations to enjoy both facilities. Okay. Well I would like to make a motion then okay. to move forward with the fitness center project in coordination with the school district. Oh yes you want to make a statement? Please. State your name and uh, please I will. And your address um, Jim Westall from uh, 213 10th uh, Street North or Southeast. And I was just, my basic question is how am I not paying taxes on this twice? Because I'm taxed by the city and I'm taxed by the district. Although I want you to know that I think this is a good thing for me because I do like going to the fitness center. I like that they're joining the pool with it and everything. I think it's a good thing, but how am I not being taxed on this twice? That's my big question. Well, I, I think you are being taxed twice, just like anyone who lives in the city limits. Yeah, but how is that fair as a taxpayer that I get to pay, that I pay twice? Not that I'm against it, I want to have it, but <laughs> well, I, I'm sure that... Well, they are two separate entities, you know, the city, school district, and the city. And obviously, the, the aquatic center and that stuff was passed by a referendum on the school district. And being part of the school district, because it passed, you obviously had, were assessed that, you know. And from the city standpoint, um, the, the only... Well, you're getting tax from school district, but, but really the tax from the city is really, uh, how do I say it, it's, it's more in your general levy tax, it's in our budget. Uh, now, if we don't raise our levy and still can cover the expenses, you really, you wouldn't get taxed twice. Does that make sense? No. Because Mike, does that make sense to what I was trying to I mean, he, he pays no city taxes. Whatever money goes to the city, is out of our tax base. Right. And so if you're taking money out of the tax base and giving it to the school, which, by the way, if you give them the $90,000, we'll be at $1.3 million that we've give them, given them for the school. That's, that was our share. Right. And I just think that somewhere along the line, uh, the city shouldn't be responsible for this because I don't know we should be in that business. Right. Not only that, the school makes a minimal amount of profit for the city by the utilities that they have. Other than that, they don't pay taxes. We're going to put a burden on SNAP Fitness and any type of fitness, and they pay taxes. So that's, that's my main concern. So well, I, think Maggie said, that. I think Maggie said it 
they're different models. Um, the snap time, any time are, are different models. Uh, you know, if the fitness center would go away, let's say in the, in the school, in the city district school, and the city didn't get involved, chances are those people would not join SNAP or any time. They probably would look at another venue like Dakota or something that would offer those type of amenities. So does so, the city pay Dakota then if they went, the people went over there? No. no. See, that's why I, I'm just not sure that this is part of what the city should be doing, although I do want it to happen. I mean, I, don't get me wrong <laughs> yeah. there. Here's how I answer but Well, first of all, if it's, you know, you have to work within your budget. You have taxes go unless the taxes went up because of this. But my answer to that, and that, that question did come up in the bond referendum, and I live in New Prague, yeah. Yeah. Um, is is your, your, what New, pra New Prague residents are getting, well, they're getting a discounted rate, by the way, on the, on the whole fitness piece anyway, but on the rates for membership, but uh, they're getting proximity. If I'm talking about the school taxes when it comes to, you know, with the school district and uh, what they're getting, if, if you want to come to city and school district. I don't like a priority. Type. Well, you're closer. I mean, it's more convenient. Oh, maybe that wasn't a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I look at. But yeah, it, it, I can see your point. In theory, yes, you 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 know. But this is no matter if the school was not involved, you'd still be paying twice the taxes. You know. Well, actually, you're paying it three times because I'm going to pay through the district taxes. I'm going to pay through the city taxes, and I'm going to pay through the membership. Yeah. Well, 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 the membership that you. I'll send you off. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, I guess, you know, it's like any other amenity in the city. I mean, this, the citizens pay for the parks in, in New Prague, but yet people outside the city can use those parks and they don't pay for it. You know, is that fair? Yes or no? I mean, you can, you can find instances down the road where there is instances that, you know, the city, because our tax base is in, in what the citizens want. They want parks, they want ball fields, they want soccer fields, this sort of thing. We don't go there and, and have someone metering at the thing. Do you live in city limits and you're using our swing set? You know, because we realize that part of being the community is, is just not the city limits, it's the surrounding area. And the school district is very dominant in the surrounding area. So, you know, to your point, yeah, in theory, you probably are. But that is not the only amenity that you're being taxed twice at. Because people from, you know, in the school district are using our amenities in town that are only being paid by the citizens. And, and it's just a fact of life. Um, because you just can't put a, you know, we can't build a wall. <laughs> can't build a wall and say that, you know, only people in New Prairie can use the parks or can use the walking paths and that stuff. because. You have to look at the economic impact of, of the surrounding area. People come in town, buy groceries, they use the gas stations, they, they think. So you have to look at it um, rather than such a narrow, narrow scope as is what is in city limits is, you know, should be ours. You have to look at the surrounding area and say, the economic impact that the school district has to the city of New Prague probably outweighs the double taxes that the people in theory, pay. But and you just got to be careful because no, and I agree. And other people's money, right? You know, that's the way you got to look at it. And and we make those decisions all the time because we really we have to be fiscally responsible, like Tim said. And and some of these joint powers things that we've done with the aquatic center, and I mean, this is my take. In, in ten years, if we wouldn't go forward with this, we'd have a room full of constituents wanting a community center. It just got turned down in Belle Plaine. Um, they didn't pass it. They wanted, a, what was it, a $28 million a bond to build a community center. It didn't pass. Right now, we have an opportunity to actually create a facility very close to a community center without calling it a community center. And I think it, in the long run, it's gonna benefit New Prague uh, for years to come. And as it grows, uh, I think, um, and again, I'm not going to speak uh, for Tim or anybody, but I can see this joint powers looking at it. 
you know, can we add some amenities to it? You know, uh, if, if we have the space and things like that. So uh, I think we're very fortunate that the school district is, is allowing us to be a partnership with them because I think they could probably do it on their own and do, do very well with it. So, I, you know, I understand your concerns. And the other thing, the other, one more question, is if they do make a profit, do they split it with the city? Or yes. Yes. yes, it's yes. a 50-50 no. agreement. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. That's yes, it's it's both ways. It's just not, I, I know Tim would like it that way, saying it's, <laughs> only, we only split the expenses, but not the revenue side, but no, it, it is a true 50-50 agreement that, that we're, we're building, so. Okay, we appreciate your comments. <laughs> Get his membership now. <laughs> 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 Any other comments? Yeah, I just want to be clear on Mayhew's motion, though. So we're going to we're voting on moving forward with the understanding that we're going to start doing the joint powers. Or are we giving total approval right now for the entire project, and then just going to work off the joint powers? I'm just getting clarification to understand. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. So. To move forward, w working with the school on the fitness center, subject to amending the joint powers agreement to address any cons any concerns. Okay, now we got. It. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Does I'll that second that motion? But everyone understand what that means. Okay, we've got a motion by Maggie Bass, second by Sean Ryan. Any other questions, comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, passes 5 0. Thank you, Tim and Debbie. Thank you. Next on the end, the consent agenda. Does anyone have any questions or issues on anything in the consent agenda? I noticed there was a lot in there. We got caught up with the minutes. Thank you to Mike and Barb for that. Appreciate that. Yeah, I have one on the May 7th um, minutes. Uh, it had to do with one of the fences, and it was brought up by Sean at the intersection of the fence with the adjacent trails and the need for signage. There was an interference there. Because of the height? It was, the height. It was kind of blind. Yeah. Well, blind yeah. Was just... Has anything been on? I know that was something that Ken was going to do. I don't know where it is. Ken's not here, so um, I'm going to approve the minutes. I just when Ken gets back, maybe he can address it at our next meeting or something. Okay, that, that was on Mr. McCormick's, I believe. Okay. Any other questions or concerns on the agenda, or consent agenda? Yeah, on Monday, May 14th, first paragraph, it's now the Mayor Clinic Health System instead of Mayo. Yeah, you got a problem with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> there's, just a, there's just an R there. Yeah. No, I really don't. <laughs> well, you, you notice that this is by Dave Rudick, Vice President of City Council. Yeah. See, I wasn't involved in that. So <laughs> what you guys did at that meeting, isn't that? <laughs> Anything else? <coughs> I'll make a motion to um, approve the consent agenda. I'll second that. Motion by Dave Ruzik, second by Chuck Nikolai. Um, there's no other comments or questions on anything on the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. The fun part, miscellaneous. Patrick, <coughs> you've been working hard today, haven't you? Any comments or anything you want to bring up? Not at the moment, no. Awesome, thank you. Mitch? I'm good. Well, hold it. I wanted the thumbs up. You know, there you go. <laughs> You know, and don't be starting to change your, your modem operanda and, and start talking to us. Jim? Uh, just that uh, Paul Bush was in today to talk about the 4th of July request for fireworks. He said uh, they are getting good donations in and uh, they are looking at doing it on July 3rd once again. So that will be at the next council meeting for the request. Okay, good. Well, that's good to hear that they're getting good donations. Yeah. 
He's, he's been working real hard at that. Yeah. <laughs> he's a talker, yeah, he likes to go and go. <laughs> That's Glenn, all I have. Glenn, anything? I've got nothing. Okay, Chris, anything else? Michael? Yeah, everyone else bailed. <laughs> I would be out the balance this week. I've such a long haul earlier this afternoon. I've been in the lateness of the day, and I'll just be out with my spouse's balance of surgery. So I'm out accessible by phone and email. Check in and out. Put it out with you, but I'll be out. Okay, well, good luck on that. Barb? No. Okay, Sean? No. David? Um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Glenn, how did the outdoor pool, I know it was jam-packed with people, uh, I don't know if it was Sunday or Monday, but it was really full. How did everything go? Oh, good. We got the pool open in time. Uh, water quality was, uh, clarity was good. All the chemicals were good. Uh, uh, the plan right now is to uh, shut the pool down tomorrow to backfill those holes and put concrete in there. Um, we were waiting for a park, so that's what kind of messed up the appearance, but the pool was usable, so mm -hmm. um, that worked out. Okay. okay. Maggie? No. Amy? Um, I have two things. One, I had some comments and um, about the sound of the video, not being able to hear it on TV. I personally haven't listened to it because I'm here, but I don't know if... Um, if that can be checked into, if it's something with the our system or we can't check. Okay. okay, Mitch, you got homework now. Do you know which one? Do you We're know all no, they said they they just stopped. generally I watch a good portion of them prior to posting them and stuff, and I'm I mean I can hear them fine. So it'd be a question of if there was a specific thing that wasn't good or you know. No, they they just said they have problems hearing it. So no, and it sounded like it when they spoke to them that it was generally all the time. Now I don't know if it's how it's getting to them, I mean, whether what service is delivering it. It's, well, and also the video online or the video on the TV? It was TV, they said. All right, I'm looking at it. I've had the same comment by an individual. He says he cannot hear it. He, uh, any other program on his TV comes through clear that this meeting does not. Just not in the volume. And I'm not saying it's you mentioning you know, anything. No, I'm just, just, I just need to know. I mean, we're working through <laughs> my video, a computer that sends it to Comcast and to Bevcom, and then their TV. So, and I don't, and and I don't have cable anymore, thing. so I can't watch it. Well, I think they have it. They can, he said he says it to Bethlehem, too. I don't know. I they should, they should be available. Right. I mean, you can't have DirecTV. Right? No, DirecTV doesn't. And then, like, I don't have cable at all anymore, so I have no ability to watch them. So I know, like, the sound. I've Like I said, I've watched the final edit of everything, and it usually comes across. So Who has cable? I know. Bethlehem. Sean, see if you can watch it some night. Yeah. yeah At 2 in the morning. It is really soft on Bethlehem. <laughs> um, well, uh, it's... I'm not even sure it's on. You know, it's supposed to be on 7, 11, and 7 p.m. And I sometimes it's not even on. It just scrolls and tells the time. The school board stuff usually is, but it's been a while since I've looked. But I mean, so I don't even know if that comes showing our meetings. Well, it's us. We do it all. You do it? Yeah. On the school channel. It's all through the school channel. Oh, city it is. Doesn't, I don't know the city even has a channel anymore. No. Okay. It's all through us. Um, I'll check with the person who updates them for the channel. Okay. Okay. And make sure that they're getting posted and also check into the volume. Like I said, if I'll find someone with cable. Someone has to have cable. Yeah. Well, Sean will try it out. I'll try it out. Right. Thank you very much. Do it tomorrow. No okay. Yeah, number two. Um, the other question is on the 2020 project, what has been the feedback with chart? Are they still going to be able to move tanks through Main Street? Has, all what's the, the feedback then? All the entire design. Chris, I'm trying to make sure that we can accommodate that pathway through the middle of downtown. 
can we work with the county? Wouldn't it be easier for them to go to to two? Um, I know that's they're, a, they're having issues with the county. Well, I know, but I, I should comment. Actually, getting through the intersection of the mini roundabouts will be easier to than the signal because they right. take the signal down. They won't go pass right over the roundabout. Right. So, anyways, I just wanted to make sure that that communication is still being verified and uh, that they've seen the. Yeah, that would like it not have to take that stoplight down. Is that what we're doing right now? I guess that's all I have. Okay. I don't have anything, so I guess I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second by Dave Brujic. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, any opposition? We're out of here. Thank you, everyone.